Hey there, here we are with another episode on She Speaks Life, and man, am I excited about this one. Today, I have with me president of All God's Children International, Holland Fraser. I love and support this awesome organization that is an orphan care ministry dedicated to answering God's call found in James 127, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress. All God's Children empowers local leaders to intervene for the millions of children currently living in institutions and create more paths to faith, family, and independence. They provide child sponsorship, domestic and international adoption, and ways to even place a child back with their family, if possible, in a healed and healthy environment. In today's episode here, Holland shares with us about how All God's Children began and how God brought her into His plan to see His children cared for. She talks about her biggest trials and how God has seen her through each one with His faithfulness and goodness. And she has many faith stories to share in this conversation, including my favorite one about a young lady named Bella too, that I extremely got touched by, and I know you will be too. So let's dive into my conversation with Holland Fraser. Hi, Holland. I am so happy you are here with us today. Thank you for coming on here. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Jamie, for having me. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Yes, I love your message. I love the organization, the ministry that you have, All God's Children International Mm -hmm. that goes out there and cares for the widows and the orphans. And so before we dive into your inspired story here, I would love for you to share with us a favorite scripture verse. Well, definitely my favorite is Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And that is just a favorite of mine, not only for my personal life, as I can just see God's plan over the years and how it's unfolded, but also being rooted in that scripture and knowing he has a plan for every child, every family, um, and we can trust him for that. And when we do, he gives us that hope in a future. Yeah, he sure does. I know. That's one of my favorites is my daughter's life first too. So (laughs) we speak that out a lot in our household. (laughs) It's so reassuring and love that promise of his. And I had the privilege to go to your recent charity that you had in downtown Austin for All God's Children International. And uh, I think this is the third year we've gone. And I just Mm. love what you are doing, you and your team and everyone that supports uh, this organization. It's so important, you know, and, and James 127 even says that what's pure and genuine in the sight of the Lord is to care mm-hmm. for the orphans and the widows in distress. And mm-hmm. it even continues to say, refuse to let the world corrupt you. And when I was looking at the scripture verse at the last mm-hmm. line there, refuse to let the world corrupt you. I'm thinking, you know, if the world corrupts you, you're not a woman or a man of generosity. You Mm -hmm. are looking all about self and um, because in the world, that is what you are doing, what's in it for me. And Mm -hmm. when we are just loaded up with God's goodness and filled up with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and we're filled with the word of God, and we are walking with him daily, we can't help but overflow in love and generosity, creating us to care for the orphans and the widows. So I would love for you to start us off with more about who you are and the organization of All God's Children International. Well, thank you. Um, So I am the president at All God's Children International, and I've been with All God's Children actually on Monday. I just celebrated my 28th year. If you can believe that, I kind of had to pause for a minute and go, wow, 28 (laughs) years. Um, 
But um, most importantly, I'm a mom to four amazing kids, three sons and a daughter. Um, we're about to celebrate my third son's high school graduation next month. So wow. the time really does go by and have an amazing husband who's a pastor out here in the Pacific Northwest of a church. And we I think we're celebrating 27 years of marriage um, this month. So mm. that's just a little bit about me. Awesome. Congratulations. We have a high schooler graduating next <laughs> month as well. And an oh. anniversary. Uh, this will be our twenty sixth. <laughs> okay, we're we're doing the same life right now. <laughs> yeah, very similar. Very oh, similar. Okay, share with us more about all God's children. So, all God's children's mission is really we're answering God's call to provide the love and care that every child deserves, and we do that by empowering local leaders to create pathways to faith, family, and independence for vulnerable children around the world, specifically for the millions of children that are languishing today in institutions. And um, really, our, we have a child advocacy model that really looks at the continuum of care of children. So first and foremost, we want to prevent children from ever falling out of family care. So we wrap resources around vulnerable families and um, work so that we can really keep children in their homes. Um, we then look at how do we actually elevate care in institutions around the world so that children's brains, bodies, and most importantly, souls can develop as God intended them to. Mm -hmm. um, we're constantly looking at how do we place children first back into families. So we do a lot of reunification work and then also do adoption and international adoption work. Um, and then lastly, we look at the children that are aging out of systems and we work to prepare them so that they can walk into a path of independence for their life. Mm -hmm. So all of that work, we kind of wrap it around with policy mm -hmm. because we know where all of that work is very individualized to the children. Through sound policy, we can have our widest reach to the most kids. Yeah. I mean, this is when I'm at the charity, you go through the structure of this and I'm blown away by how organized it is and how everything has its proper place and it's run just like clockwork. I mean, it's just amazing to me how well it flows and everything is covered, you know, from A to Z with mm -hmm. these kids. And so I would love for you to share with us, how did this organization even begin? Tell us the origin of the story. So All God's Children was actually founded by my older sister, Heather, and my parents back in 1991. And um, when my sister was 16, she went to my parents and said, I want to drop out of school and I want to get my GED, work for a year and go to Bible school in Europe. And of course, my parents said, that's not happening. You're going to graduate <laughs> high school. There is not a chance we're letting you get your GED. And my dad haphazardly made the comment, if you can get the superintendent of Portland Public Schools to tell me that's a good idea, that's about the chance you have of getting a GED. And sure enough, a week later, the superintendent of Portland Public Schools was on the phone with my dad, and he just said to my dad, you know, traditional school is not for everyone. And I really believe your daughter has a really strong plan and head on her shoulders, and I think you should support her in getting her GED. Mm -hmm. So um, she did. She got her GED. She worked for a year and at 18 headed off to Bible school in Europe. And on one of her summer vacations, she called my parents. And I mean, this is before cell phones, you know, you're writing letters back and forth. Mm -hmm. But she had called them and said, hey, I'm not coming home. Um, I want to spend the summer and I want to go to Romania and work in the orphanages there. And mm -hmm. if those that can recall back, you know, 1990, it was war in Romania. Ceausescu had finally been assassinated. And the people, I mean, there was bullets right. still in uh, walls and tanks still in the streets. And she went and volunteered for two months in orphanage number one. 
And when she did make a quick trip home before going back to school, she had photos of kids. And um, there was just one little girl that my parents threw a very long story. I won't share all of it today, but um, ended up really placing it on my parents' hearts to adopt. And um, Heather ended up going back that Christmas. Mm -hmm. The little girl my parents originally had wanted to adopt a week before she was leaving to go back to do that adoption, she had received a letter from the orphanage director that said, if I would have received your letter two days earlier, I would have kept her here. But a family mm -hmm. just came and she's gone. She was adopted to New Zealand. Wow. And um, so my parents just said, you know, we believe God called us to do this. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna trust him that he knows who this child's supposed to be. So she ended up going in at Christmas of 1990 and Hannah, my little sister had just been born to her single mom who was 18 years old, the same age as my sister. Um, and she had had an affair with a mayor in a village. And so she had, was literally planning to have Hannah and would, uh, was planning to place her in an orphanage. And so my sister was able to be with her and then figured out the adoption and came home and January of 1991. So because she was just so young and it was one of these, the first kids coming out of um, Romania mm -hmm. post-communism, a lot of news stories were there. And my sister made the comment, I would help anyone who wanted to help a child. And mm -hmm. from that day forward, my parents' phones started ringing off the hook and they both left their careers and All God's Children was founded. Wow. Okay. So it began with your family. Did, mm -hmm. didn't mean necessarily maybe you were prompted to <laughs> join this just because. So what happened with you? Well, I was 14 at the time of uh, Hannah's adoption. And I will yeah. say I was the kid that said, I will never, ever, ever work for All God's Children. So <laughs> I uh, left for college at 18 to Tennessee and um, I was looking at going into education and um, my now husband at the time um, we were dating, but he came back up here to go to seminary. And um, it just started really that I just needed a part-time job. So I started just answering the phones. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, I, I, can, I can do that and still right. go to school. But um, as God, as we know, does. He mm -hmm. just kept through circumstances, like opening a door, opening another door, as I mm -hmm. just kept saying yes. And, you know, what's interesting is when I look back on it, anyone, even from a young age, if they ask me, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what do you want to be? I always had the same answer. And it was, I want to be a mom. I want to be yeah. home. I want to be with my kids. And so through no, different, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. through different circumstances, just with all God's children and ups and downs and how life goes. Every time I tried to get home after having my kids, I just was not at a place where we could. And so, you know, today being able to look back and just see, you know, what I really wanted and had planned for my life, but to see what God had known all along, you know, there is, it, 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 there's, you know, not all of getting old is great, but some things of getting older yeah. is great. And one is you have a lot of years that you're able to look back on yeah. and just see how God has moved. Yeah. Love those hindsights. Yep. They're great. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> oh, no. oh my goodness. Yeah. It was oh. a dream for me to be a mom to you. And I just, that's a dangerous word to never, never say never. <laughs> Never, never ever. Yeah, that's that what you that never word, say, right? So, yeah, <laughs> probably exactly. the opposite. Of, if you ever okay. say it, just know he's going to U-turn you probably the other way. <laughs> totally. All right, let's go on a detour. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can see God's hand in so many places over the years with this organization. But maybe share with us a few highlights of how God has guided this organization in the last 30 years. You know, we just um, had this timeline that we put together. Um, and it's I, I love looking at it because the work we're doing today, I can tell you, I would have never dreamed or imagined the significance and the impact. Um, and I can't even say we are having 
when I say it, it's like a big W of God is having around the world because we're just seeing his spirit move and like open doors that we would have never, ever fathomed he would open. Mm -hmm. But as we look at kind of how he planted those seeds over the years, we can see in 1991, we started doing that permanency work with the adoption of Hannah, mm -hmm. where we are doing re reunification. In 94 is when we actually did our first elevated care model, where we went into an institution and like brought elevated care into it. And then by 95, we did our first family preservation program. But from 95 to 2008, the work we're doing today just kind of, I wouldn't say it stalled because we were doing adoption and we were still doing orphan care, but I would say it was flipped a lot more adoption than probably um, the orphan care side. But in 08, we ended up partnering with the Bulgarian government where we were able to sit at the table and help them rewrite their um, child, like their family code, which actually um, dealt with how they cared for their kids living in institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, and then eight years after that is when we did, launched our first program for children that were aging out of the system so that we could prepare them for mm -hmm. a life of independence. And so when I kind of look back on the work we're doing today, it's so neat to be able to see how God planted seeds. But then we had years where sometimes it honestly felt like we were in the desert. Right. Like, would we make it some years? And, you know, this ups and downs, but um, watching what he's done since 2017, we launched our very first child advocacy center in Bogota, Colombia. And to see the movement that has really taken place in that country and now what's starting to unfold throughout Latin America mm -hmm. um, is just something I would have never imagined mm -hmm. or fathomed. Yeah, it's just you just sit there in awe and wonder at what God does with just your your faith and obedience, your little yeses, and He just turns it into something just so much bigger than who we are, you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's just it's, great. You know, we had this. I had this one meeting. Um, this was in Colombia, probably five years ago. But we had just launched launched our child advocacy center, and you know we're really if you ever talk to our team, we're really big about breaking cycles, so looking at how do we break cycles of trauma, cycles of sin, because we know at the root of this orphan crisis and why families are not stable and just so much pain in the world, the root of course is sin, but what comes out of that sin is generational trauma, and that is just being passed on and on and on. And um, we had this opportunity to do, about five years ago, a conference with um, the child welfare system, um, social workers in Bogota. And we were planning to do probably like a training for two to 300 um, staff on trauma and the effects of trauma, and then how you can actually bring healing and transformation to that. And um, I happened to be in the country a couple of weeks before that training. and. A staff, uh, our VP actually of international called me and said, um, we really want to get some judges to this training and see if we can get the judicial side of the government also understanding because they're the ones working with the parents. We can work to bring healing and transformation to the kids, but the mass majority of those kids are going back to their families and they're not healthy. Right. And so um, through kind of a, a long story, but God's just intervention, I ended up getting a meeting with um, the Procuraduría de General of the country, who is the third in control of the country. And um, I was told, you know, come Friday, I thought I was meeting with just a judicial judge in a back office. And I show up to the building, the Procuraduría building, and they took me to the top floor overlooking the whole city. And the Procuraduría de General came in. I had no idea, Jamie. I was right. not prepared. I just was inviting a few family court judges to a training. Anyway, but I had probably 20 minutes. He had his whole entourage with him and I was able to share just um, our hearts in that if we're working to really bring lasting generational change, we need both the judicial side and the child welfare side coming together. So he said at the end of this meeting, you know what we're gonna do? I'm not gonna send some judges. 
we're going to host this training here at the Procaduria's office. Wow. And if you stay after, let's have a round table to see how we can make lasting change here in this country. And sure enough, two weeks later, what we had intended to be two, 300 people, he streamed the training throughout the country and it reached 1600 leaders. He had wow. Supreme Court justices open that conference. Amazing. And I just share that to say, when I think of like pivotal moments oh, sure. of where that's not a, that's not all God's children, that's God just yeah. stepping into a room and like yeah. changing hearts and moving hearts of the right. right leaders at the right time. And really that's now laid a footprint in not only Colombia, but throughout Latin America on the work mm -hmm. that we're doing to really bring healing to deep, deep generational trauma. Mm, I love it. God's intervention for sure. And yeah. I love the video that you guys played at the charity event in Austin of the woman's testimony with her daughter and how the mom was an alcoholic and she was mm -hmm. abusive to the daughter. And mm -hmm. just to see how all God's children stepped in to not just, uh, you know, place this daughter with other family, but to treat the mom and to, and I'm sure it, it looked like it was a journey. It was a process. It wasn't an mm -hmm. overnight fix, but mm -hmm. the mom chose to accept Jesus and to get mm -hmm. the healing that only Jesus can give. And then at the end of the video, it shows the daughter with the mom and it's a healthy environment. It's no longer mm -hmm. a toxic one. And so you guys not only help place, you know, the orphan, but you also help the families. If there's still a family, uh, somebody that's related to them and mm -hmm. help them with their traumas, get to the root of what is dysfunctional and the sin that's creating the turmoil. So yeah. I just love it. I mean, you guys just seem to do it all. And so I know not every organization is perfect. I know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've gone through some of the biggest trials because the enemy is, you know, on attack when we do things for the all glory the of the Lord, no doubt about it. So yep. uh, could you share with us some of those enemy attacks and how you saw God's faithfulness get you guys through? Wow. So, you know, it's like there is a laundry list of them, right? right. Like where I could you tell you over 28 years, it's like, where do you right. begin on it from both? You know, yeah. and it's the thing is you look at all God's children and, and huge ones, like in um, 2011, we, we just saw over um, a period of like five years, the floor really come out of international adoption. So for the first probably 15, 15 to 20 years, of um, the ministry's life, adoption was, I would say, a primary um, component of mm -hmm. how we funded all of the work we did around the world. Well, we had a period of time where when adoption really went from 23,000 children being united with, with families every year, this mm -hmm. last year, I want to say it's right around 1,000, if that just gives you a picture of right. how international adoption has changed. But from a financial side, we just saw that kind of uh, floor fall out. And so we had a period of like five to seven years, I would say, where it's like we had to, in order to keep doing the work that God had called us to really change how we were talking about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just hard. I remember I was just, you know, the board had asked me to take this role of president. Um, my youngest was a year old, so just little. I said no three times, finally said yes, but then we kind of went through this desert period. And mm -hmm. um, I think a significant moment for me um, was probably about three years into that. So th we're not talking a quick, I prayed a prayer and God was like, here mm -hmm. it is. I mean, yeah. it was nights staying up. I made scripture cards. I'd wake up every night, lot just of read script, a lot of waiting. Yes. But um, we had this moment where um, just an individual out of the blue called me and said, you don't know me, and this is going to sound crazy, but the Lord has just been placing on my heart the last three weeks. I'm supposed to call you and ask you if you have a financial need. 
And, you know, I've told this person since then that in my mind, I was going, don't sound desperate, don't sound desperate. But, you know, um, but I remember going, you know, it's been a hard quarter. And um, Uh but anyway, after on this call, he wrote us a $70,000 check. Yeah. And um, at that time, I mean, it was just like, for me, it was significant. For the ministry, it was significant. Uh-huh. But I think what I watched happen was, you know, I had for so long said, I trust God. I know God has it. Mm-hmm. But I think he was waiting for my head and my heart to, like, make that connection where it was there. And it's like the minute I did that, yeah. um, he provided and provided in a way that my works would have never accomplished. It was a, co- a complete right. stranger. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's significant as even to this day as a leader of the importance of trusting God in everything. He yeah. can do it. He will do it. Um, it's not always on our timing. Um, but also from that moment forward, all God's children just went upward and onward. And um, mm-hmm. so for me, probably if I look back in the... 32 years. Um, it was a trial, but just to God be the glory and how he ended up providing. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, when you do ministry, I, I say this to, um, young women all the time. Like when you step into meaningful work in your life, the enemy does attack and, Mm -hmm. um, where that I've seen it on, um, work front. And then you see it on home fronts. I mean, my Mm -hmm. kids have had hard things happen. Like you just see the enemy tries to, you know, take you off. And it's just incredible though, to see God's faithfulness through it. So what do you think is next for you and all God's children international? Well, we are right now um, looking at expanding that child advocacy model Mm -hmm. throughout Colombia. And we're really seeing doors open um, throughout Latin America right now. So Um, definitely looking um, to see God just continue to move in really big ways. Um, You know, we have this kind of saying um, within our executive leadership team and really with our staff, but we want God, we want people to know the size of our God through the size of our vision. So Mm -hmm. we just are believing the Lord for miracle after miracle. And we're we're watching it. And, you know, we launched our second child advocacy center in Ethiopia about two years ago. And we're looking to open our third child advocacy center in Asia, most likely Mm -hmm. the Philippines next year. And so we're just continuing to see just God move, but most Mm -hmm. importantly, people's hearts change and children's hearts Mm -hmm. change. You know, um, we, this is just literally this week, this happened, but We have a young woman in um, our House of Hope in Ethiopia. Um, It's the reunification home that you saw the video on at the at the uh, the event. Event. But um, we we had this uh, this young woman Betty. uh, Well, I'm changing her name to Betty, but um, she her story was um, when she was just seven years old. um, Her mom died. And her dad was an alcoholic and he was abusing her. So at seven years old, she ran away, got on a bus and landed in Addis Ababa, the capital. She survived two days on the streets. I mean, imagine seven, seven years old, two days on the streets before a woman found her, brought her to the child welfare office Mm -hmm. where they then placed her in the only institution that's in Addis Ababa. So Betty, for the next nine years, would go on to grow up in this this place. And it, it's not a place any of us would ever want our kids to be. It's for, it's for young people, mm-hmm. young girls from age six all the way to 19. So mm-hmm. if you imagine that right. scope. But when we went to this orphanage, um, we had just opened our House of Hope. And so we went and asked, we said, hey, Are there any young girls that you think you could transfer to us um, and we could work to help find their family and get them reunified? And we said, you know, we really would like your your hardest kids. We we want those kids. That's who we want. And they said, well, there's this one young girl, but you know, I she she's unmanageable. Like that's what they called her was unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Um 
And they said she was hopeless. Those were their quotes about Betty. Mm -hmm. Um, But they let us meet with her. Betty refused to come on our first meeting, but we went back a second time. Um, Today, Betty will tell you, she she knows now that it was the Lord on why she said yes. Mm -hmm. But she said at the time, she didn't even know why she said yes to coming. Mm -hmm. Um, But when she came for the first two and a half, three months, she would not engage anyone. She was cold. She was hardened. Um, You know, when she came, um, this was a quote actually from the orphanage director to us. She said, you are her only hope. And without um, attempting reunification and helping her, Betty will either end up on the streets or dead. Mm -hmm. That, That was a quote from the the director. But anyway, Betty had really quit doing school in fifth grade because she just had a super hard time at school. She she never could go. Um, but as she was at the House of Hope, and I mean, we have an amazing caregiving team. Um, she refused to do counseling for three months, finally agreed to do counseling. Um, our counselor starts every session with prayer, of course, but sings hymns, like in mm-hmm. praise songs before the mm-hmm. session. And slowly, Betty then said, you know, I'll, I'll take part in the daily Bible study. Mm-hmm. And we just started to see the Lord work on her life in like wow. a huge way. Mm-hmm. Um, we found out that the reason she hated school and why she couldn't go to school when she was at the orphanage was because she was actually at school when she heard that her mother had died. Aww. So every time the orphanage would make her go, she would sit there and relive that moment of losing her mom. And um, so as we were able to work with her, I mean, we just watched this young woman who now is 17 years old blossom into this young woman that God always saw her to be. Mm-hmm. And um, we did, unfortunately, we're not able to look at reunification with her family for her. But this week, um, she is moving out down the street from the House of Hope. She's going to a vocational training program. She's finishing her education at night. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're done with this, Jamie, I have to send you just her photo. I mean, you just see it in her eyes. She has become the mentor for each of the girls in the home. And when we have a new girl enter, Mm -hmm. she's the one that sits down with that girl and shares her story and how Mm -hmm. she didn't want to be there and how God totally transformed her. And um, they all now refer to her as like the fifth special mother because she's just like this mother now to the girls. And I share it to say, you know, it's great. We can do global work, but it always comes back to the one. And and even the reunification isn't possible for her. It's always about what does God's plan, what is that plan God has for her? We maybe were thinking reunification. No, Mm -hmm. she's going to transition to independence but she's fully healed and restored. And that is what this work is about. Totally. That's the beauty of it all. God's transformative power with our hearts and, oh my gosh, and her being a living testimony to those others so they can relate with her and she can relate to them. Just a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that. Okay, I love ending with a takeaway. Maybe the listener here is just enjoying and taking this all in, I'm (laughs) sure, and just going, oh my goodness, how do I get involved? Um, What if, you know, it seems scary to them? What do you think you would like to say in an encouragement for them to ponder on or take action in? Well, a a few things. Um, And whether with us, with another ministry that's serving um, orphans, like you kind of opened and shared, it is a calling to um, help the orphan and the widow in their distress. And whether that's down your street or if that's around the world, I think it's it could be even looking at families in your community that have adopted, reaching out and seeing, is there respite that you could give that family? Are there ways? that you could be supporting them. Um, We have different ways families can get involved. So we definitely have a prayer um, team that we just love so much because they're constantly uplifting the work that we're doing and the needs that we have um, in prayer. Um, There's also, we have a great um, program that we call Cycle Breakers. And for $24 a month, 
Um, you can choose what region of the world, or you could say global, but it's a very personalized update on how um, you can be a part of breaking those cycles for Betty and for the young girl that you saw last month when we had the event, but really bringing families into the work. Um, the Cycle Breakers, we have a sponsorship program for one-to-one -one sponsorship families could get involved with. Um, we do also have an international adoption program if families were feeling called to adopt. Um, there's children that are waiting all around the world for a forever family today. Um, we see a lot of those kids are over the age of five um, and in large sibling groups. So it definitely takes a, a certain family that really is called to that to do step into that. But so many ways to just be a part of the work and make a difference um, in the life of a child. So great. Well, thanks, Helen, for coming on here. You are amazing and your whole organization is just absolutely wonderful. I love everything you guys are doing. So thank you for thank coming you. on here and sharing. Thank you so much for listening today, and I trust that God has encouraged you through this story. Did you know this podcast is on YouTube? Hop on there and subscribe, and you can see a live recording of each episode. And for more information on this ministry and to access free downloads, please visit my website at jamieelizabeth.com. That's J-A-Y-M-E elizabeth.com and let's connect beyond this podcast by going to my instagram handle jamie elizabeth she speaks life or facebook until next time my friend i hope god reveals himself through your own life story